There is a stereotype that has grown up around Jane Austen, a caricature. Her works are often perceived as irrelevant or twee nowadays, her storylines as predictable, and herself as the most negative personification of that most amorphous and misguidedly titled genre, chick lit. Appallingly unfair, this sort of representation is the curse of brilliant writing a few decades after heavy fame. For Jane Austen essentially created such a strong story blueprint that she has been riffed, referenced, and outright ripped off a thousand times since. Because of that, it is virtually impossible to watch or read a rom-com, social satire, or period drama without picking up Austenian overtones. And so the author, known mostly for her wit and her impeccable use of irony, has herself become something ironic. A relative unknown in her own lifetime, who today is so famous that she bores readers with what was intended to be refreshing. Jane Austen's first novel was essentially written by the time she was 20, but she was unable to secure a publisher until she was 35, and it wasn't for her first novel at all, but for her second, which she called Sense and Sensibility. When she came to publish her first novel, she changed its original title from First Impressions to Pride and Prejudice. And this is important because it tells us essentially four different things. First, it tells us that Jane was susceptible to market pressures. She changed her second title in an attempt to create a brand footprint, and to use the type of titular alliteration that was very popular in Victorian London at the time. This is different from someone, say, like George Eliot, who was determined for her books to be serious and political. Second, it tells us something about the emotional maturity of the author. She is using a more complex title to express a more complex theme within the book. And third and fourth, we have the hints provided by the titles themselves. First Impressions tells us that the book is going to be about first impressions. And indeed it is. Pride and Prejudice takes that and deepens it by indicating that those first impressions are probably going to be wrong. I have heard Pride and Prejudice described incredibly simply as about two characters, Darcy and Elizabeth. He was proud and she was prejudiced. But actually, all the characters express some kind of pride and some kind of prejudice. But it is worth noting that the two central characters, and the ones most worthy of our approbation, learn from their mistakes. One of the criticisms of Victorian writers generally, unfairly I think, is that of narrow focus, of mostly writing what they know. Jane Austen is no exception. And so, virtually in parallel to Dickens, who mostly wrote about male characters that lived in the city, we have a writer who mostly writes about female characters who live in the country. It's a valid criticism in terms of literary analysis. What it doesn't do in any way, I think, is detract from your enjoyment of the books, unless you're never planning on reading anything else. It is impossible to talk about Jane Austen without talking about irony. Indeed, she stands with people like Woodhouse, Voltaire, and Wilde as the absolute maestro in her use of it. From the very first line of that book, Pride and Prejudice is drenched in character irony, situational irony, and verbal irony. Here are just a few examples. At the beginning of the book, Mr. Darcy makes a comment about Elizabeth not being beautiful enough to tempt him to dance. Later, he marries her. He takes Mr. Bingley away from Netherfield because he believes it would be imprudent to consort with a Bennet, and then he marries one. He marries Elizabeth, who prides herself on her perception, but completely misjudges him. When Mr. Collins hints to Elizabeth that she might come round to his idea of a proposal, she tells him she would never refuse someone the first time and then accept them the second, which is exactly what she does when Mr. Darcy asks her to marry him. Lady Catherine attempts to prevent their marriage, but accidentally hastens it, incidentally displaying the exact same vulgarity that Darcy originally used to condemn the Bennet family. Depending on the type of reader you are, you might have noticed a lack of physical description in Austen, both of characters and of places. And when there is some, what's very interesting about Pride and Prejudice in particular is how that description is almost directly transferable between place and person, by which I mean that the owner or occupier of that property seems to be personified by the character of that property. For example, Longbourn is described as respectable but not grand, attractive but not overpoweringly so, and appealing to others 
while still very independent. Now that, that description could almost exactly apply to Elizabeth Bennet, who lives there. Then we have the contrast between the description of Rosings, where Lady Catherine lives, and Pemberley, where Mr Darcy lives. And that's very interesting because both of those are described from Elizabeth's perspective. So although Rosings is admirably grand, it leaves her cold. Pemberley, on the other hand, she adores. And it's interesting that that is the place on which most description is lavished. Cleverer people than me have pointed out the imagery behind the descriptions. For example, there is a stream there that has been made into a great water park using skill and resources, which is a perfect allegory for Darcy himself, a decent man swollen into a great man by money and stature. One of the criticisms that does stand up is that Austen is deeply uncomfortable with strong emotion, dreadfully reserved British and Victorian. It is quite noticeable in her writing. For example, she deliberately moves to an impersonal, abstract voice once Elizabeth actually accepts Darcy. She immediately, though not very fluently, gave him to understand that her sentiments had gone through so material a change. It doesn't even have the passion it had when she was complaining. Mrs. Bennet is a fairly foolish, shallow, transparent woman. She is desperate to make good matches for her girls and is not above some embarrassing sycophancy where the rich and powerful are concerned. Like many of Jane Austen's characters, she is an exaggeration of a genuine social anxiety. Because for someone in her delicate social position, getting so many daughters married off would have been a serious business. Mr. Bennet tends to be a much more popular character, a calm, passive man who wants little more than a quiet life. Master of the bon mot or clever witticism, he restricts himself mostly to his newspaper, his library, his garden and a tendency to make fun of his wife. Elizabeth is his favourite daughter. Together they are both realistic as parents and as people. Although they are characters, they are not caricatures despite some comic exaggeration. They are deep, real-seeming people who offer contradictory life lessons. During the novel, for example, we learn that Mr. Bennet married his wife because she had once been young and beautiful, but that these days she is often an embarrassment to him. Then again, he himself is often absent or reluctant to make any kind of decision. He doesn't even bother to come to the assembly ball where Jane and Elizabeth first meet Darcy and Bingley, and he has a tendency to retreat to the sanctity of his library during moments of confrontation. We might also ask the question of why he hasn't made any effort to make provision for his daughters by this point, given that he knows that his estate can only be inherited by a male, and why he allows his youngest and most foolish daughter Lydia to go off to Brighton with only a teenage friend to chaperone her. As to the question of whether it is better to jump straight in and look foolish like Mrs Bennet, or to remain indecisive too long like Mr Bennet, the answer rather appears to be neither. No one is harder on Mr Darcy than the author Sebastian Folkes, who I once heard describe him as a man totally without shame, unapologetic, hypocritical, self-centred, full of boundless arrogance and determined not to apologise for any of his faults. Personally, I rather like Mr Darcy. For me, he represents the quintessential English rigidity, the person who stands at the side of the ballroom and makes sarcastic comments, even though inside he longs to dance. Yes, he makes mistakes, and then he makes those mistakes worse because of his pride and his refusal to compromise. But when he does eventually realise how wrong he is, he owns it, no matter how hard the path to redemption might be. I agree that he is flawed, very flawed, but he is a man of honesty and genuine integrity who shows himself capable of personal growth and I happen to think that a very laudable thing indeed. Elizabeth is the main character in this book, a person of sparkling wit, spirited humour, general good sense and all-round attractiveness. She is beautiful without being overwhelmingly so, hard to read, rarely serious, intensely loyal to her sister Jane and to her father, and a woman of good moral fibre. She is also, it has to be said, someone of a rather practical disposition, which may be noted by the way she talks about her developing love for Darcy. She began to comprehend that he was a man whose disposition would suit her own. Again, she makes mistakes in her judgments, and despite the associated mortification, owns them, realises those mistakes, and grows as a result. And for that, she is justifiably 
a compelling protagonist in an excellent novel. Thanks for watching. Thank you.